good morning, or probably maybe afternoon. I don't know. It's morning for me. Um, hello, everybody. I'm obviously still in Santa Barbara, and it's pouring. So, um, so I may as well record lectures. So um, I just want everyone to know I've had some questions on where the podcasts I have linked the podcast to, and they are on the syllabus. And I have checked them. They're okay on my end, but let me know if you are still having any issues. Um, I will have to figure that out. Most of them are out of Sawbones. And you'll notice I've added some extra credit um, episodes that you can of Sawbones that you can listen to. And actually, I think I'm going to just go ahead and open it up. So if there's anything on there that you find interesting, um, go ahead and listen to it. And um, I'll give you credit for that too, because I'd rather you listen to stuff and, that you find inter interesting. And most of it would pertain to class in some way. Um, the other uh, extra credit I have uploaded is a PBS documentary on eugenics. It really explains um, a lot about our system in general and, um, and how uh, a lot of racism um, flowed over into eugenics, of course, that makes sense. But then we're still working through a lot of the stuff that was started back at the turn of the century, last century. Um, so uh, that one I gave, I'm giving a five points for, and um, the it's already up in the discussion board. And you can just um, put in just free form just um, thoughts that you have on that documentary. So I'm going to go ahead and we are in lecture three. Right now, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So today we're discussing discussing um, medical services through from 1980 through the ACA. And this is going to be pretty much um, talking about medical systems that have how the medical system has evolved um, up to the ACA. There's not a lot of um, other uh, more um, but in, I had didn't add a lot to this. Okay, so just to kind of recap, so pre-1980s, we basically had unmanaged care. If you remember when we were talking about, like doctors were able to um, pretty much charge whatever they like to um, uh, Medicare, Medi um, well, Medicaid, uh, and to insurance companies up to this point. And um, there were small co-payments. Uh, we still had a lot of fee-for-service payments. The, but at the same time, medical um, technology and hospitals were increasing. So hospitals needed to figure out a way to pay for these. So the way they would do it is charge really high amounts um, to Medi uh, Medicaid and Medi-Cal and, and Medicare. And just a reminder, Medicaid and Medi-Cal are actually the same. It's just we like to change. Um, California likes to put their own spin on things. So we call it Medi-Cal. Um, so there was uh, that moral hazard of excessive use because insurance, uh, um, because of insurance and physicians and consumers. So in the 1980s, going to present, we now have what's kind of the era of managed care. So, and this is really an attempt to reduce inefficiencies as well as reducing um, premiums, kind of a, a physician's gatekeeper. So this is where we start to, you, you start needing um, to get referrals from physicians or, and then also that, that stop gap on physicians just ordering a lot of tests or charging too much for tests, that kind of thing. Um, this is a selective contracting. So you, where we started to see provider networks. So um, 
if you have the a provider network, I'm just going to kind of explain this a little bit and we'll get into greater detail on this. So um, specifically with our vision, if you have the UC SHIP um, vision, they have preferred providers that you actually get better um, prices with. So even though you can go to our dental care is the same way, you can go to any dentist you want, but you're going to probably end up being charged more. Uh, but if you go to their in-network dentist or eye doctor, you will not, you will be charged less. So that's that selective contracting provider networks. Um, and then utilization review. So prior authorization for hospital admissions, et cetera. So that's um, like we need the, um, when you need to get referrals from your doctor. And um, the use with the UC insurance, we actually don't need that, but they do have specific um, uh, doctors that they work with. And that is just for our, for UC Merced in general, because we're a rural community and there's not a lot of um, doctors here and we don't have Kaiser, we don't have a lot of um, other uh, resources as far as medical are concerned right now. So um, cost, so managed care is basically a cost containment mechanism for health, um, health, uh, systems. So uh, it's a system that uses financial incentives and management controls to direct patients to uh, providers who are responsible in giving appropriate costs and care. Um, the goal is basically to re reduce costs but still improve the quality. And um, so this is also known as uh, man or as uh, an HMO. And I think the easiest one for us to think about is Kaiser. Kaiser is the um, kind of this, um, like the gold standard of managed care, right? Um, and I, I can't think, a lot of other insurance companies tried to go this route and we'll get into um, those really quick. So types of managed care plans. So you have a health maintenance organization. So that's the Kaiser, that's the HMO. And this organization is, ins ensures a group of individuals against cost of medical services and provides them with medical service. Um, physician rations care based on their perception and benefits and the cost of treatment. So there is kind of, the, you do get into that rationing of medical services with some, of, with some of these HMOs. And you'll get that, you'll hear about that with Kaiser a lot. And rollies usually pay a fee for the year and they receive their health care from, from this organization. And rollies usually have low payments um, inside their network and higher costs outside of network, which is kind of like a penalty. So um, if you were out of state or if there is an emergency, you could go to any doctor within um, uh, that you wanted to with Kaiser, if you had Kaiser insurance, and they would actually reimburse you some, probably not the full, um, but if it, there, it, under certain circumstances. So Kaiser Permanente. So a preferred provider organization, that's a PPO, and that's what I was talking about with our Delta Dental and also our vision coverage. You usually pay less if you go to care within their network and you pay more if you go outside the network. So, um, so you can choose any doctor, um, you can go to any hospital, but if you go to out of, um, but if you are out of their network, then you get, um, then you don't, then you have a higher cost. If you're within their network, you don't need a referral. It's pretty easy to get around. And this is somewhat what we have with Blue Cross and uh, Anthem. Point of sale, uh, point of service. So you can choose anyone between an HMO or PPO um, when you need care. 
So anyone will take your money. So what happened is um, we talked a little bit about this. Nixon loved this HMO plan. He really liked what um, Kaiser was doing. And so that was he was really trying to move in that direction um, back in the early 70s. Um, and that, of course, remember, that's when these costs were go through the roof and the government was pouring money into the healthcare system because there was no um, stop gaps. So um, these HMOs really started to take off. So um, it started before 1987, but that's when we really started to see it increase. And um, through the late 80s and into the 90s, it really took off. Um, and in this time period here, we actually saw a lot of insurance companies trying to start their own um, HMOs. Um, I actually had Cigna for a while, um, which was horrible. Uh, none of them could quite get to that Kaiser level. It was really interesting. Anyway, so at about 1990, it started to level out in 2000 and started to decrease. And we'll get into why that is now. Then again, there was a blip here in 2005, 2006, where they started to increase again, but quickly um, it leveled off. And um, I don't have the current data. I, it'd be interesting because it does seem to be taking off again. And I think a lot of that's due to Kaiser. Um, I need to try to get, try to see if I can find another diagram for this. I haven't been able to find one yet. Um, so distribution of um, health plan enrollments um, and covered workers by plan type. So conventional is the um, is regular, your Blue Cross, you can go to any doctor, whatever. Um, so 1988, um, you see like most people are have that conventional, you have your insurance, you can go wherever you want, you can, you know, um, the regular, the, the premium plans, everyone kind of had that premium plan, right? But then down here in, um, in 2013, you see, wow, 57% here have this PPO. And that's kind of like what we have where there's a preferred providers, but you can still go outside. Um, but what's really crazy is when you look up here in 1996, well, actually even before then, um, uh, you see that it's about 31% have the traditional HMO like the Kaiser. And then, um, and it's pretty, uh, it's almost even between a Kaiser type um, plan and a um, PPO plan. But now it's really the majority for quite a while now has been the PPO. So, <laughs> excuse me. So changing practice of medicine. So at this time, we're really seeing, <coughs> excuse me, um, medical care shift. So it's going from, you know, before the, the private, the single um, doctor in an office to really these group practices. And there's many reasons for that. And we kind of started talking, it's um, similar to why um, doc, we started moving towards hospitals again. So um, the days of the country doctor are now long over. Um, so we're moved from solo MD practices with fee for service um, payments to these larger medical groups. Um, this is really the growth of management, managed care actually encouraged those large medical groups. Um, patients are required to use in-network providers like we were talking about. There's discounted prices for, um, for medical doctors and increase in PCP demand. Um, so types of med medical groups, single or multi-specialty groups, multiple physicians so are now sharing a facility. So they are also sharing equipment, medical records, support, administrative staff. 
So they also share the payment and salary discounted feed for service and caption. So um, cap it. Um, capitation. So that's when, um, especially for, um, actually Kaiser has capitation as well. So they're only, that's where they cap the costs that um, can be charged, right? And they contract with the health plan. Um, patients are, and then associated with that group. So we have that, right? You have your group number on your meta, if you, everyone pulls out your medical card. So go ahead grab your medical card and look at it. You'll have a group number and you're part of the UC system um, or you might still be a part of your parent system or whatever you have. So you're part of a group system. That group system tells those doctors something about you. So you are a student within, if you have UC SHIP, you're, that tells them you're a student, you're um, young, healthy, whatever or you're part of the faculty and staff. So you have, um, you're kind of tagged with this tag, right? And we know that if you're part of this group, um, and we talked about this a little bit, if you're part about the, of this group, you're safer, right? You, you're not gonna take as many crazy chances or your job is not that, that dangerous. Now, um, when we were looking at and I talked about this earlier when I was looking at insurance and we we're comparing my husband's insurance with my insurance and mine was so much less expensive because he's part of this other group, right? He's part of that group that their job is not the safest job. He works in construction, even though he's a foreman and runs a job sites, um, he still has to go out to these job sites. They could be dangerous. He does a lot of driving, that kind of thing. Um, independent practices or IPA. So we still have these. Physicians have their own offices, patients, staff, and do their own bid building, kind of like that Dr. Quinn medicine woman. You have to look it up. It's really good. Um, if those of you have who haven't seen it. Um, and there's loose associations with other physicians. So um, some of these, I'm trying to think. Um, so we do have doctors that are part of like say um, Sutter Health. This is kind of, uh, yeah. So we have, um, you have doctors that are associated with different hospitals like Sutter Health. They might have several. So they could be associated with Mercy, which is part of Dignity Health. And they also have contracts with, um, Sutter Health. So they really, they kind of have this loose, loose association with other physicians. And a lot of times they have fee for service, which is either discounted or not. So you walk in, you pay when you do. Um, I've noticed this with um, a lot of the urgent cares in the area are kind of going to this model where they're um, you go in and they do take your insurance sometimes. I've had them ask, even though I have insurance, they still want, like it costs me more money there than, um, than it would going to a, you know, a different urgent care that's within our PPO group. And it's really hard to tell until you go in um, what they are. Um, so managed care in the 1990s. So this is, remember back to that graph, this is where the growth really took off. Employees demanded less restrictive plans though. So there, this is um, the HMOs back, well, the, more of the Kaiser plan were super restrictive. You couldn't go to other doctors. You couldn't do a lot of um, things underneath them. You had to go to those hospitals. Um, and increase the cost of care and premiums that were happening at this time. Um, there were a lot of mergers between hospitals and medical doctors, which also gave rise to this, um, the PPOs. Uh, and the rise of a lot of multi-hospital systems such as um, Sutter Health and Dignity Health. Um, and uh, nonprofit hospitals, which that's what Dignity Health is a nonprofit. Sutter is supposed to be a, um, a nonprofit as well. 
so that there's really less competition. So, um, uh, and a lot of these other hospitals started to close. So, because they weren't a part of these big conglomerates. So there was also a reduction in capacity within hospitals. However, people really started to get upset with the lack of choice within the HMO um, denials. So, uh, and these, these stories took off in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and oh, I guess this one was 1999. So a uh, patient with a longstanding migraine headache experienced a change in the nature and duration of that headache. Her de um, MRI was denied, and this I believe was a Kaiser, and the patient had a sub um, subbrachial hemorrhage and um, a few months later. So she ended up passing away. A four-year-old girl ran a high fever following a five-hour ho hospital stay uh, um, for a tonsillectomy, considered an outpatient operation by this HMO. Her mother took her to her HMO pediatrician who didn't take the girl's temperature, didn't examine her throat, and didn't refer the doctor back to the surgeon. The girl died of a hemorrhage at the surgical site. Now this one is hard because that doctor didn't, I mean, yes, it was an HMO, but that doctor didn't do their job, right? And didn't take her temperature, didn't look at her throat right after surgery. Even though this is um, an HMO, this, I don't know that the HMO had anything to do with this. I think it was just um, bad, a bad pediatrician period, but still, um, so th this, there was another one, um, there was several of these type of stories and they gained national attention for this. So um, the public res there was a huge public response. There was a growth of consumer advocate groups, increased legal activity against these HMOs. Um, and this led to increased government regulation and with minimal length of stays. So like, um, now they, they can't just do an outpatient tonsillectomy, for instance, on a young child, they have to stay in the hospital. Um, and appropriate outpatient procedures. These were already, to be honest, in, in um, the guidelines, but the problem was um, these HMOs weren't following the guidelines, really. Um, so managed care in the 21st century. So there's a lot of chronic disease management, which this is good. Kaiser is really good at, man at management programs and healthy uh, preventative care, which we didn't see. And that was an issue prior to managed care. There was, doctors didn't make money if they were preventing your disease. They only made money if they were treating your disease. So we didn't have a lot of prevention and managed care really led to prevention. So report cards, consumer information was um, released now. And so, and so this is where you're getting, we're getting a lot more prevention programs. So 1990s. Um, this was the early 90s and the Clinton plan. Clinton was trying to get universal health care. And this was really placed in the hands of Hillary. She designed this plan. Um, so uh, um, listen to it and then remember this plan compared to the ACA, which we'll, we'll have a slide on that. So each citizen would be enrolled and for, in a qualified health plan. Um, you could not be dis disenrolled by your health plan, which was another huge issue with um, insurance companies and health plans at this time. If you went too often or, um, uh, or just, they would just disenroll you for no reason. Um, you can be disenrolled until you're covered by another plan. There was a listed minimum, minimum coverages and maximum annual out-of-pocket expenses for each plan. Um, they proposed regional alliances of health providers to be subject to a fee-for-service schedule. 
So we kind of have that. So think of that um, kind of like Golden Valley or Alliance. That's what um, kind of their uh, model is. People below cer certain set low income levels were to pay nothing. Um, so the result was a massive ins insurance company resistance and these Harold and Louise ads, which I'm gonna show you one. Um, and what was the reason for this, the failure of this at this time? So it was really done kind of in secret. Like they put this all together, but really there was just a small group. It looked, it looked like they're all just plotting against the insurance companies and against um, medical, the AMA. Um, and it was led by Hillary Clinton, which at this time she didn't, but prior to this, she didn't really have like any, um, uh, reputation or anything. She was the wife of the president. She was the first lady. And before this, the first lady really didn't do like big programs like this, even though she was highly educated and was probably would have been the person you would hire to do something like this. She had worked on stuff. She was a lawyer. Um, but it, it just kind of was felt wrong to the American people at this time. So there just really wasn't enough buy-in um, from Congress to get this through. Um, and they didn't bring any doctors to the table. They didn't bring insurance companies to the table. They didn't bring doctors to the table. They basically just developed it themselves. So here we are, we're at Clinton's healthcare reform. We've talked about everything else um, in 1993 um, to 94. We'll then compare that with the Obama signs, the ACA into law. So um, key, so just to kind of reiterate what was going on in the 80s. So we had, we're going through this managed care backlash, major healthcare diversity of delivery policy issues, the rising cost of healthcare, it was going through the roof. Um, or at least we thought so then, we didn't realize how much it could go through the roof until now. Um, a lot of people had gas, gaps in health insurance coverage. There's it, access was really becoming an issue at this point. Geographic uh, maldistri maldistribution of personnel and facilities. So rural areas still just like today did not have doctors. Um, access to healthcare, um, healthcare services by served uh, by ability to pay social class, age group, and geography. So we still kind of see that. And at this point, I actually lived in rural California and we uh, still don't have a doctor in my town. Um, we would actually get antibiotics from the vet because we did have a vet, um, especially in the winter because we'd be snowed in and we didn't have a nurse or anything. Um, it's a little better now because transportation's gotten better, but it's still a huge issue in many rural mountain communities within our state as well as throughout our country. Um, so in the 1980s was the era of government regulation. Government had been paying um, their costs plus reimbursement. E Early 1980 introduced the DRGs, and we'll talk about this in more detail. So these are the diagnostic related groups, and that's how they figure out what to charge for Medicare. Um, and honestly, um, we only use it for Medicare, but other countries have taken the RDRG approach and used it in their national health systems. So we have this amazing way to um, control costs that doctors actually approve of um, and in other countries they use, but we don't use it across the board. So good on us. Um, basically, and the goal was to identify the products that the hospitals provide and pay fixed amounts for each product. And this is what the DRGs did. Um, so the DRGs are a homogeneous unit of a hospital activity 
to which a binding price could be attached. So this is done at Harvard. And what they do is like, say you go into the doctor for um, whatever, a sore finger. And so what the DRG um, costs do is they follow you at every step through that process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and how that works through. So this forced hospitals to alter their behavior of alter the behavior of the physicians and surgeons and provide practice pattern information. Um, and it reduced the overall inefficiency and waste within the system. Um, so DRGs, early hiccups. Um, so there are perverse incentives for healthcare providers, the DRG creep or cream skimming. So um, what they started, what doctors started to do is unbundle hospital stays. So if you went in, before they would kind of lump everything together. So you went in for a tonsil, um, tonsillitis, but then while you were there, you had, um, they noticed something else going on. Um, so what ended up, a, ended up increasing healthcare costs and increasing regulations because instead of, there was kind of double dipping. So they found you had your, um, your uh, excuse me, tonsils taken out, but then at the same time, they would be, I don't know what, what could possibly go out. Um, oh, so like with kids, they would get their tonsils taken out and sometimes get the ear uh, earplugs at the same time, but then it was easy to unbundle those and charge double for the, the overlap, right? So whether that was the bed, the nurses, whatever, they could um, unbundle that and, um, and charge you twice. Um, adjustments. Um, differential level of DRGs and monitoring of reimbursement panels. Uh, this is how they kind of figured, uh, like came back with more regulation. The results it's used today, um, complained about by doctors. Sometimes um, doctors are complaining about anything though. And, um, but it's also seen as very efficient. The problem is it's still a basically fee for service because Medicare, Medicare is fee for service overall. Um, but it also does not yet um, encourage prevention. So it's not, it's basically, um, it's not, um, it's just a cost, it's just costing out. It doesn't um, encourage doctors to, not see patients or um, it doesn't encourage doctors to um, send patients to health classes rather than, you know, um, sur or liposuction or whatever. Or I can't remember what the other one is. Um, so the most common DRGs. And so if you have gotten lab work before, um, you'll notice like uh, when you get your little fit receipt at the end of your doctor's visit, this happens at my pediatrician more than anyone where I have to walk up the card and they'll have circled all these numbers like P1, no procedure listed, other procedures. And so these are like the um, uh, most common DRGs and they'll like circle them. And then if you need lab work, there's another number they put in there. Um, so been here long, Obama plan 2009. Oh, can't believe it was that long ago. And Clinton plan 1993. So we're going to talk about some healthcare reform. Um, different policies to um, achieve universal health care. So one individual mandate, everyone is required. And this is was under both there was an individual mandate. Um, everyone was required to purchase health insurance um, and subsidies are provided to those in low income. Just like Clinton's plan, the ACA has this as well. Employer mandate requires all employers to purchase health insurance for their employees or pay into a pool um, of those who, aren't work, who are not working or part-time. 
Single payer system provides comprehensive coverage with no limit of out-of-pocket payments and can eliminate private insurance. So I'm going to hold on. Pause, pause. Yes. Americans, stop. Before I begin my Oops. words tonight, I would like to ask that we all Crap. bow in a moment of silent a prayer. Second. Sorry, guys. And let me share this. Sorry about the phone call. Dang it. For the memory of those who were killed and those who have been injured in the tragic train accident in Alabama today. Amen. My fellow Americans, tonight we come together to write a new chapter in the American story. Our forebears enshrined the American dream, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Every generation of Americans has worked to strengthen that legacy, to make our country a place of freedom and opportunity, a place who, where people who work hard can rise to their full potential, a place where their children can. Oh, shoot, hang on, hope that it'll come right back. can have a better future. From the settling of the frontier to the landing on the moon, ours has been a continuous story of challenges defined, obstacles overcome, new horizons secured. That is what makes America what it is and Americans what we are. Now we are in a time of profound change and opportunity. The end of the Cold War, the information age, the global economy has brought us both opportunity and hope and strife and uncertainty. Our purpose in this dynamic age must be to change, to make change our friend and not our enemy. To achieve that goal, we must face all our challenges with confidence, with faith, and with discipline. Whether we're reducing the deficit, creating tomorrow's jobs and training our people to fill them, converting from a high-tech defense to a high-tech domestic economy, expanding trade, reinventing government, making our streets safer, or rewarding work over idleness. All these challenges require us to change. If Americans are to have the courage to change in a difficult time, we must first be secure in our most basic needs. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the most critical thing we can do to build that security. This health care system of ours is badly broken, and it is time to fix it. Despite... Despite the dedication of literally millions of talented healthcare professionals, our healthcare is too uncertain and too expensive, too bureaucratic and too wasteful. It has too much fraud and too much greed. At long last, after decades of false starts, we must make this our most urgent priority. Giving every American health security Health care that can never be taken away. Health care that is always there. That is what we must do tonight. <laughs> on this journey, as on all others of true consequence, there will be rough spots in the road and honest disagreements about how we should proceed. After all, this is a complicated issue. But every successful journey 
is guided by fixed stars. And if we can agree on some basic values and principles, we will reach this destination and we will reach it together. So tonight I want to talk to you about the principles that I believe must embody our efforts to reform America's healthcare system. Security, simplicity, savings, choice, quality, and responsibility. Okay. Go back to this. All right, it's going to make me go through my slides one by one again. Sorry, guys. Hopefully it won't. We'll see. Maybe not. Woohoo. Okay. Okay, so this was the announcement in 1993. Um, oh, shoot, Let's try that again. Okay, so there we go. Hopefully I have it off now. So this is his announcement of um, starting the healthcare reform. Okay, so the Healthcare Security Act of 1993 AKA Hillary Care. And there was this whole um, uh, campaign about give them health, Hillary, and like all this stuff at this time, which was actually pretty, um, pretty cool. Um, but it guaranteed private insurance for all um, and an individual, individual mandate to enroll in an HMO, PPO, or fee for service plan. Um, you were supposed to have the choice of your own physician with the health plan, and it was supposed to eliminate unfair insurance practices, which were minimum, there were going to be minimum, minimum standards for insurance products, state-based health, based health and care alliances would collect money and contract with provider networks and groups for regulation and prevent um, preservation of Medicare, because seniors love Medicare. Everyone loves Medicare. Health um, benefits were guaranteed through the workplace and employer mandate to cover full-time employees. So what were the benefits of the Health Security Act? Why did it fail? Private healthcare organizations, Republicans concerned about government regulation and profit reductions, massive insurance company resistance, these Harold and Louise ads, which I'm going to show you, they were they were pretty good. Um, so let me stop share and go to the Harold and Louise ad. Hold on, let me put this on pause. Sorry, I'm talking my way through this. Not that it's helping. Ugh. Okay. And notice, so notice right here, um, features both RNC and DNC ad campaigns. The Harris Lisa, okay. Um, oh, this is uh, from the President Library. Uh, actually, at the end, you'll see who pays for it. It's all insurance companies. And hopefully. I don't get it. Congress isn't passing the health care reform America wants. The problem is, they don't get it. We've been clear about the reforms we want. Private health insurance we can all have even if we've been sick. Coverage we can keep even if we change or lose our jobs. Coverage we can afford. So why can't Congress write a law like that? That's a very good question, like all the questions Harry and Louise have been asking over the past year. But it seems like some in Congress aren't listening. I'm Bill Gratison, president of the Health Insurance Association of America, the sponsor of Harry and Louise. 
Before taking this job, I served 18 years as a member of Congress from Ohio. I was the ranking member of the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, so I know a little about health care and the Congress. Bill, what is this new Medicare program? Is that for everyone? It's called Medicare Part C, and it's a surprise to most Americans that the Congress would even think of creating a huge new entitlement program like this. But they are, even though most Americans agree with the President that everyone should be covered by private health insurance. The cost and quality consequences of this are enormous. Experience shows that taxpayers are bound to end up paying the tab to cover the inevitable shortfalls. People with private insurance already pay 30% more for their hospital bills alone to cover the underpayments. Under this new plan, this hidden tax could increase to 85% or more. Well, government should police the plans, keep everyone honest, but I'm not comfortable with government-run health care. That's not the reform we want, and Congress needs to get that message. What can we do? Tell Congress, keep working to get health care reform that's right for everyone. Private insurance, but no government-run health care, no tax on benefits, and no government-imposed spending limits. If you call, they'll listen. Believe me, I've been there. Please. Do you know anything about this tax on health benefits? Congress may load on a bunch of new taxes for their health care plan, including a tax on plans they think are too expensive. Too expensive? You know, the quality we like, the doctors we want, plans like ours. Wait a minute, I thought health care reform was supposed to save us money. Don't count on it. Well, this isn't the reform we want. We need to send Congress that message. Tell Congress no benefits tax. Call today. Well, I'm glad the president's doing something about health care reform. He's right. We need it. Some of these details. Like a national limit on health care? Really? The government caps how much the country can spend on health care and says that's it. So what if our health plan runs out of money? There's got to be a better way. There is a better way to reform. Call this toll-free number for the facts. Call today. Okay. So you notice that, yeah, and this goes on. You guys can watch all of them if you want. It's, uh, there's quite a few. Um, uh, so you notice um, if you can remember some of the same arguments for that we're going against ACA were the ones they were just reusing those um, from um, the Clinton plan. And so I always find it interesting. I'm like, oh, there's that one, there's that one, and you kind of take it through. Um, so basically they um, it's they kind of dug up all the kind of like the Harold and Louise arguments and tried to push them onto the ACA plan. The difference was everyone was already at the table. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, so single player support and single payer um, uh, advocates within Congress um, supported, uh, also opposed um, the Clinton plan. So types of um, insurance coverage from 1999 to the, um, 2000, of course, private, most of the majority, any private plan, um, employment-based was really high. Um, and then, uh, uh, so government insurance, and that's, um, um, Trying to think what government insurance that would be covering uh, employees, I uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and a military. Um, so that's the veterans. But here we had this no insurance, and that um, you know fourteen percent of people were not covered in two thousand or in nineteen ninety nine, and this is only a one year difference. That's why the numbers aren't um, different. Um, people without health insurance there um, for the entire year. Um, and basically this was people who were couldn't afford it um, and didn't qualify for um, Medicaid. 
but look at so um, look at these numbers in the Hispanic population: forty-three percent, thirty-six percent for Asian and Pacific Islanders, thirty-one percent white. I mean, and these are straight numbers; they're not per capita. Um, so legislative history of patent protection and Affordable Care Act. So 2008, the recession hit, right? And 2009, or, and then in November 2008, um, the national election. Of course, with the Great Recession was, especially in California, um, started in about 2006, but really hit the peak in 2008. President Barack Obama was um, elected and we had the majority in the house, the Democrats had the majority in the house. So this is kind of looking at, so of course, red versus blue. Uh, in the Senate, they had 57 Democrats, two independents, which who did, um, who also would lean Democratic and 41 Republicans. So they had the majority across um, the, the House, the Senate, and um, they had the white, the Democrats had the White House. So this was the time to push through um, health care. And so that's when Obama taxed Congress to work on health care reform. By the summer 2009, there were several bills drafted. And remember, they only have two years to do this. So they really had to go fast. And something it's similar to right now where um, the Democrats have um, the House, the Senate, and they need, if they want anything, they need to push it through as fast as they can in the next two years. Um, in July 2009, the House of uh Representatives Ways and Means and Education Label approved the health care reform bills. In August and through September, House town hall meetings throughout the United States. And this is where the growth of the Tea Party and where um, Trump really gained his um, support was within this Tea Party movement. So in 2009, this is one of the um, town halls in Hanford, Connecticut, healthcare reform. So it was really, I mean, just like now you hear the difference between the, um, the parties. So Democrats gonna set up death panels and, to, and hurt up and euthanize all senior citizens. Republican terrorists don't want the truth to be heard about Obama's, um, dare I say, masterful healthcare plan. That was MSNBC tonight. Kathy Griffin and Joan Rivers weigh in on Teen Choice Awards on CNN. So same thing, same arguments, all of it. Um, so the public is split on inclusion of, inclusion of the interest groups. And I must say, I was like, uh, I don't know. Healthcare, um, forty-seven percent um, believe healthcare interest groups are too narrowly focused on their own interests and should not be a part of the process. Forty-five percent of people, healthcare interest groups, add to the important perspective and should debate and should be included in the process. Eight percent don't know. 39% Congress should design the best healthcare legislation it can and not worry about healthcare interest groups and support. And 51% healthcare interest groups will pay and play an important role in carrying out changes in the system. And it's important to have them on board with the legis legislation. So, and if you remember back to the Clinton, they learned from the Clinton um, failure that not having these interest groups, because there's a lot of money behind them, and they knew those Harold and Mod, um, Harold and Mod ads would be coming back uh, and bite them again if they didn't include the interest groups. Um, so, is Congress listening? Um, do you think members of Congress are playing too much or too li little about the or about the right amount of detention when it comes to groups or state? Uh, what groups are saying about changes to the healthcare system. 
So too little um, is the dark one. So people thought they're, they weren't really listening to um, the actual people, listening to them. They weren't listening to people on Medicare, people who have health insurance, they weren't listening to them. Um, they felt that they weren't listening to public opinion polls, people who don't have insurance, academic um, researchers and healthcare experts. So that's coming right about um, even um, with too much and uh, about the right amount. Um, financial experts and economists is about the same there. Um, religious groups and then going down the line. So um, who got their messages heard at ta um, uh, at town halls, groups opposed to plan and currently just dis being discussed in Congress. Um, so people really thought that the groups opposed to the plan um, were listening uh, too much. So, but look down here at who's sponsored. This is NPR. Um, and not that their stuff is bad, it's not, but the people who listen to NPR are generally, um, people who are, are college educated and um, more liberal leaning um, demographic. I mean, they do have other demographics. Um, so just keep bear that in mind when you look at some of these um, legislative history. So in December um, 2009, the Senate passed their bill. On January 10th, special Senate election was won by Scott Brown. Um, so he took um, Senator Kennedy's spot and Senator Kennedy was um, very active in trying to get this bill passed, um, whereas Scott Brown not. So um, they then had the budget reconciliation process, healthcare and education reconciliation back act of 2000. 10, on March 23rd, 2010, Patent Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed into law by President Barack Obama. And we'll take a look at this. Let's stop this. And pause. This is kind of cool. Um, Today, I'm signing this reform bill into law on behalf of my mother, who argued with insurance companies even as she battled cancer in her final days. I'm signing it for Ryan Smith, who's here today. He runs a small business with five employees. He's trying to do the right thing, paying half the cost of coverage for his workers. This bill will help him afford that coverage. I'm signing it for 11-year-old Marcellus Owens, who's also here. Marcellus. Marcellus. Marcellus lost his mom to an illness and she didn't have insurance and couldn't afford the care that she needed. So in her memory, he has told her story across America so that no other children have to go through what his family's experienced. I'm signing it for Natoma Canfield. Natoma had to give up her health coverage after her rates were jacked up by more than 40%. She was terrified that an illness would mean she'd lose the house that her parents built. So she gave up her insurance. Now she's lying in a hospital bed as we speak, faced with just such an illness, praying that she can somehow afford to get well without insurance. Natoma's family is here today because Natoma can't be. And her sister Connie's here. Connie, stand up.
I'm signing this bill for all the leaders who took up this cause through the generations. From Teddy Roosevelt to Franklin Roosevelt, from Harry Truman to Lyndon Johnson, from Bill and Hillary Clinton to one of the deans uh, who's been fighting this so long, John Dingell. To Senator Ted Kennedy. And it's fitting that Ted's widow, Vicki, is here. It's fitting that Teddy's widow, Vicki, is here, uh, and his niece, Caroline, his son, Patrick whose vote helped make this reform a reality. I remember seeing Ted walk through that door in a summit in this room a year ago one of his last public appearances. And it was hard for him to make it. But he was confident that we would do the right thing. Our presence here today is remarkable and improbable. With all the punditry, all of the lobbying, all of the game playing that passes for governing in Washington, it's been easy at times to doubt our ability to do such a big thing such a complicated thing, to wonder if there are limits to what we as a people can still achieve. It's easy to succumb to the sense of cynicism about what's possible in this country. But today we are affirming that essential truth, a truth every generation is called to rediscover for itself, that we are not a nation that scales back its aspirations. We are not a nation that falls prey to doubt or mistrust. We don't fall prey to fear. We are not a nation that does what's easy. That's not who we are. That's not how we got here. We are a nation that faces its challenges and accepts its responsibilities. We are a nation that does what is hard, what is necessary, what is right. Here in this country, we shape our own destiny. That is what we do. That is who we are. That is what makes us the United States of America. And we have now just enshrined, as soon as I sign this bill, the core principle that everybody should have some basic security when it comes to their health care. And it is an extraordinary achievement that has happened because of all of you and all the advocates all across the country. So thank you. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I would now like to call up to stage some of the members of Congress who helped make this day possible and some of the Americans who will benefit from these reforms. And we're going to sign this bill.
time, so it's going to take a really long time. <laughs> So he uses every pen um, because uh, everyone that's standing behind him gets that pen as, and then one has to go into the Smithsonian. almost done with this lecture. Okay. So a little moment of history for you. You can read this when you're, um, when you're in the slides, it's pretty funny. Um, so health insurer, your excuses are not providing me with coverage that I have been denied healthcare reform. Um, so you can look at your tunes explain. Um, can we, so this kind of, this um, explains, uh, this is by, done by Kaiser. Hold on, I'm gonna, uh, no, don't play yet. Let me sh stop share and share this. So this explains the um, Obamacare. Well, it's finally happening after years of drama on Capitol Hill, a Supreme Court case, a presidential election, and a Mayan apocalypse that could have stopped it dead in its tracks but didn't. The marquee elements of the Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare, are about to kick in. And big changes are coming to health insurance in 2014. In the next few minutes, you'll get a pretty good lay of the land by once again watching your fellow Americans, the U-Tunes, find their way through the system. There are four main ways nearly all of us will experience health care once the health reform law goes fully into effect. About half of us will get insurance through our jobs, just like today. About a third will get covered by the government through Medicare and Medicaid. About one in 10 will buy insurance themselves. And unfortunately, another 30 million of us or so, just under one in 10, still may not have coverage at all. But let's begin in the workplace. Many Americans are already covered by their employers, and for them, not a whole lot will change. There will be some new advantages, though, like caps on how much you have to pay out of pocket and free preventative care. The bigger changes are coming for those who work for larger companies but aren't covered now. That's because the government is going to require companies with 50 or more employees to cover full-time workers or pay a penalty. So more workers may find themselves covered. Smaller employers won't face the same penalties for refusing to buy insurance, but they'll be encouraged to do so. 
The government will be setting up special marketplaces to make it easier for small employers to take the plunge. Some will be offered temporary tax breaks if they do. And unlike now, insurers can't inflate prices if some employees are sick. So many of us will be getting covered at work. A lot of us will be covered with help from the government, just like today. Not much will change for seniors on Medicare. The law has already started helping with prescription drugs and better preventative care, and that will continue. Medicaid, on the other hand, is expanding to cover more of us, especially poor adults, many of whom aren't eligible today. If your income is low, Medicaid will cover you, most likely in a private insurance plan. But there's a catch. The Supreme Court ruled that governors and legislatures of each state should decide whether or not to be part of expanding Medicaid. In states that get on board, the feds will cover almost all the cost. But for those who don't, you may be left with the same options you have today if you're poor. So you'll want to check out your state's decision if you think you might qualify for Medicaid. Even with employer coverage and the expansion of Medicaid, a lot of us will still be left out. For those not covered or who find their work coverage too expensive, a new way to buy insurance on our own will be popping up everywhere. They're called health insurance marketplaces, though they may have a fancier name than that in your state. The health insurance marketplace is like a virtual insurance mega mall. Here you'll find private insurers competing for your business, and you'll be able to pick out how much coverage you want and how much you want to pay for it from cheaper, high-deductible bronze plans to more expensive platinum plans. Still, all plans will cover a comprehensive set of services like hospital and doctor visits, maternity care, mental health care, and drugs, most everything any of us need, at least when it comes to medical care. As with Medicaid, not all governors are on board to set up these marketplaces, but the feds will open their own in those states, and so you probably won't notice much of a difference. One big advantage of buying insurance through these new marketplaces is that the federal government will provide most people with a tax credit to make insurance more affordable if you don't have any other options and your income is below a certain level. In fact, most people buying on their own will be eligible for a tax credit and won't have to pay the whole premium themselves. And the marketplaces will make sure that insurance companies operate fairly under strict rules. They'll have to offer everyone insurance, even if they're sick. They won't be able to charge more for pre-existing conditions. Unlike today, men and women will pay the same price. And prices for older people will come down, while young people will pay more. To keep costs down for young people, though, they'll be able to stay on their parents' plans until 26 and buy low-budget catastrophic plans until they're 30. Of course, all these changes still don't mean insurance will come cheap. Most people buying their own coverage will end up paying less with the new health insurance tax credits. But some people will have to pay more, even though many of them will be getting better and more secure insurance. So let's be realistic. Not everyone's going to run out and buy insurance. Some might say, hold on a minute. If I can't be turned down or charged more, why not just wait until I get sick or injured to buy insurance at all? Well, first, you can only get coverage during special enrollment periods. So if you snooze, you may lose. And second, thanks to something called the individual mandate, if you're not insured, you pay a fine, making this option seem not nearly so clever. Still, if you really can't afford to buy in and can't get insurance anywhere else, the government will waive the penalty. So don't panic. By now, you've probably noticed a lot more people will be getting a lot more coverage. Where will the money to pay for that come from? Taxes. Many of them targeted at the health industry itself, even tanning services. Yes, individuals will pay too, mostly the wealthiest Americans who will be paying more into Medicare. Also, hospitals and insurance companies participating in Medicare will get paid somewhat less. Not painless, but somebody's got to pay. So, as Americans prepare for 2014, how will you be covered? How would you like to be? Now's the time to figure it out and get on the path to setting yourself up for the best insurance at the best price. After all, who wouldn't want that? So you'll notice that um, this was the 20, 
from 2014. Um, and there were some changes and after um, uh, Trump took office, he did roll back the individual mandate and it's still on the books, which is why um, when the, um, he couldn't take it off the books because he just signed an executive order um, reducing the individual, the penalty to zero, but it's still a line item. So that's actually what kept the um, Affordable Care Act in place. Um, now the Affordable Care Act is designed to address all these issues by making health care coverage available and more affordable to all Americans by improving health care and delivery and paying for it based on its quality, not the number of procedures performed and products provided, and by creating more affordable options for uninsured people and small businesses. It has been attacked. It has been attacked from the left believe it or not, for not having a public option. That is for leaving insurance companies with too large a role in healthcare. And it's being attacked from the right for increasing the role of government in healthcare delivery. That was um, from our President Bill Clinton. So individual health insurance mandate. Um, this is the one that I was just talking to. The affordable healthcare included an individual mandate to obtain um, health insurance. It must obtain coverage through an employer, private insurer, or government program such as Medicaid or Medicare. This um, started in January 2014 with a fine. Um, the penalty it, in 2016 was 25% of your household income or max of um, $695 per adult and $347.50 per child and a maximum of $2,085 per household. Um, and of course, this was rolled back to zero. I'm, um, uh, so I'm not gonna share this actually. I'm not gonna, uh, you can click it when you get to the, uh, if by looking at the slides because it's no longer and we're, starting to run long. Um, so of course it was um, repealed by Congress on December, 2017 uh, by the Tax Cuts and um, Jobs Act and um, which was then effective in 2019. The Affordable Air Cla uh, Care Act included an individual mandate to obtain health insurance. Oh, um, so all of these were repealed. Um, the National Federation of Individual Businesses at all versus Sibelius Secretary of Health um, at all in 2012. So this is the Supreme Court rule that ruling that um, ruled that the um, Affordable Care Act was um, constitutional. So it upheld the individual mandate to purchase health insurance. The federal government cannot coerce states into expanding Medicare, however, um, and they can't lose their federal funding if they don't. So it's upheld because it's considered a tax. The federal government does not have the power to order people to buy health insurance. The federal government does have the power to impose a tax on those without he um, health insurance. Which And because of this ruling by Chief, Chief Justice John Roberts, every time that they've tried to come back and repeal the ACA, um, but um, it has failed because it's considered a tax and because instead of saying there's no longer a mandate, it just rolled the mandate to um, the cost to zero. Um, so premiums, so for a family of four, um, so this is just a subsidy scenario. So a family of four, um, 40 year old non-spoken um, uh, parents with two children, their income is $4,417 a month. So for a total of 53,000 a year. Um, unsubsidized premium is would have been um, $962. 
Then they get the tax credit, which is 646. So their total premium paid under Obamacare is now um, $317 per month for a family. So, and then for a retired couple, their income is 25,000 a year. So this would be their monthly premium. Then their subsidy is um, uh, $1,271. So they would be paying $94 a month. Single adult, 30 years of age, making 30,000 per year. Um, the, the premium is $428. They get a tax credit of $76, so they're paying $352 a month, and that's how it's supposed to work. So King versus Brunel. King versus Brunel was presented an argument that subsidies could not only be used to purchase health insurance from state established exchanges. Mm. So premium assistance amount for qualified health plans offered an individual market within a state for people who are enrolled through a state exchange and established by a state. So in a three to six ruling, subsidies could be used to purchase health insurance from state or federal exchanges. And so future issues, issues that are coming down, um, so states are still pursuing health care reform. California adopted individual health insurance mandate in, starting um, January 1st, 2020. Insurance disparities by state. So there's still a Medicaid gap, expansion gap. Um, this has changed a little bit. Not much. Kansas, I believe, is no. Maybe it's Missouri. I'm trying to remember. Some of these other states are now starting to um, uh, take the Medicaid expansion money. Um, they're still uninsured. Um, this is 2018. I need to find a better one. So there's still people that, um, especially in states that didn't expand their Medicaid, there's still a lot of people that are left not covered. Um, so, but what's interesting, this is our projected how, um, healthcare expenditures. And the thing is, I think that's in this one. Um, we expected in 2019, um, our, or maybe it was 2020, the, for um, the expenditure to be 17.9%. It was actually quite a bit lower than that. So um, it is considered a, um, uh, the ACA is considered to be really effective. Um, public priorities, uh, healthcare issues for Congress. So they still are look, working on lowering prescription drug costs, uh, maintaining the ACA's pre-existing condition projections. And of course, we heard a lot of rumbling that this was going to go away and never has. Um, lowering what people pay for healthcare is still a huge issue. Expanding government help for those buying coverage uh, somewhat of a big issue, but not quite as bad. Implementing national health care. And so this is back on the table again. And um, of course, repealing and replacing, they've tried several times. I don't think it's, it's definitely off the table now. Um, public is divided whether Medicare for all and public opinion are similar or different and public opinion or similar or different plans. Um, so, um, oh, public option, sorry. So Medicare for all and the public option. So these are actually the same, just with um, different names. And I find it interesting that people don't really understand that they're the same. And the ones that, um, somewhat different, very different, very similar, somewhat similar. So, and it's really, it's divided almost in half between Democrats, independents and Republicans. Like they all are kind of like not really sure what, um, what people are talking about. So this really, we really need to start clarifying um, 
are how we talk about these plans and what they mean so people understand what you're talking about. So that is it for this lecture. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, so go ahead and look at the syllabus for your assignment. Uh, um, the assignments are up, so you can be doing those now. Um, the quiz is gonna open up next week for this, um, for this section. Maybe I'll open it up now. Because uh, I notice a lot of you are doing everything ahead of time. That's why I've been putting stuff up pretty fast. So, um, and I'm actually the one that's behind in lectures, I guess, although this is still ahead of the syllabus, but it looks like you guys are trying to get stuff done pretty quickly. So I'll keep loading stuff as we go. And then on Wednesdays, I'll just kind of open it up for whatever questions from um, whatever lectures or assignments. So I will see you guys Wednesdays and enjoy your weekend um because i'm doing this on a friday so um i will see you all soon take care bye